Welcome back, Heart Warriors. Diane Kayser here, your hostess. And I've got a really, really special guest and very dear friend of mine here today to talk about, well, courage. Um, you guys may have heard me refer to Brene Brown and Elizabeth Gilbert. She's the Eat, Pray, Love chick. And what I've learned from these women is that the most difficult thing to do and to be in this life is ourself. And to show up with courage and vulnerability to express who we really are and take our mission to a bigger pool of people who are really wanting to be themselves and to, um, to step in, just to step in, to step into their authentic self. And because we're always, we're, so many of us are just trying to be who everybody else tells us we should be. And what I admire so much about our guest today, Maria Kang, the no excuse mom, as you may know her, is that she has developed and she has expressed, I would say, unlimited courage to be herself because her mission is much bigger than her ego and caring so much about what other people think because she really believes in her mission. So Maria Kang, welcome to the Heart to Happiness Project. Thanks for having me, Diane. How are you, pink sister? I know, right? I'm all <laughs> pink too. <laughs> yeah. I'm doing great. How are you? I'm awesome. I'm, I'm really, I'm in my heart today. Whenever I do these interviews, it's funny. Um, I feel like I'm, you know, what I've been assessing lately is like, is what part of me is, is acting of the ego right now and what part of me is acting of the heart. And so whenever I get, you know, I control that, like, where am I, where am I, realizing that you know this more than anybody I know, that we have to wear different hats. We can't just show up as like, oh, I'm so hard, I'm so butterfly, because then the world would just bulldoze us. But mm -hmm. then if, if we showed up with all ego, then we are not our authentic goddess self. And that's the feminine kind of nature that is, I think, a gift today. So I, I feel like your, your persona, your actual real self, does a really good job with balancing heart and ego. So um, how, let's start with a, a raw story. When you first shared your, what's your excuse images on social media, mm -hmm. were you afraid of speaking your mind? Was, was there any fear of doubt on, on judgment when you first shared that image? Oh, absolutely not. When I shared the image, I knew what my intentions were and my intention was to be motivating inspiring let people know that they are, can overcome excuses and challenges in their life i knew that i came from a place where obesity was a big issue in my life and it i struggled with being overweight my mother struggled with health related issues and our country struggles right now so i, I came from a very good place with very good intention and despite a lot of the backlash, I was never, never wavered. I was just always very strong in my intention that this is who I am and this is my message and let's have a conversation. Right, right. And that's, that's when I first actually reached out to you is um, I was at, I was in Hollywood at, at Trader Joe's and one of my friends said, you've got to follow this chick. She's, she's all over a national news because she took a stand and saying that and challenging our mindsets, challenging our lack of movement, lack of eating healthy um, mindset, not caring enough about ourselves. And when I looked you up, I went, why is the media jumping on this woman who has the courage to say it like it is? And it's like, everybody wants to take things so personal. Like they, they make it about them. And I, and, and that's kind of what my movement is, is too. It's, is stop caring so much about what other people think, of course, care about other people, but, but weighing that much judgment on their judgment means that we're we're hap we're making happiness outside of ourselves. So, what I love the other day, um, I saw you post something on your Facebook, and you wrote, "I was accused of being a narcissist, a fat shamer, and a bad mother who cared more about my body than my kids." With rising healthcare and the normalization of obesity, it's no wonder my campaign to identify excuses and combat complacency created a lot of pushback, con um, conversation, and controversy. Well, I'm still here, people. I love it that you say that. Like, hey, I'm still a warrior, and I'm still asking, what's your excuse? We have hundreds of, hundreds of free moms groups throughout the world encouraging, supporting, and educating each other to be healthy role models, role models for our family and our community. So, guys, um, go on Facebook and, you, and find them, the No Excuse Moms group. Uh, we don't believe in fad diets, waist trainers, fat loss pills, or the latest and greatest fitness advertisement. We believe 
in each other. And then I love when you wrote, health starts at home and accountability is the key to your success. You are what you eat, you are what you think, you are what you watch, you and who you hang out with and the people that you follow. And then you wrote, it's time to clean house, welcome to mine. And then you showed pictures of all kinds of women in the moms groups who, I, I know you've cultivated a lot of friendships and strong bonds with a lot of women through that group who really want to take accountability and are motivated and are tired of hearing their own self-talk of excuses. So. Yeah. In your community, what do you emphasize and what do you see daily where you see moms um, happier when they do what? What's the formula? I think the formula is people are happier when they are less involved with themselves, to be honest. You know, when you take the emphasis off of you, 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 and you start to be more giving, it changes everything. Um, and, it's, and it's funny that I say this because you know, as mothers, that's all we seemingly do is give to other people where our tank at the very end of the day is very empty. I mean, there are days I feel incredibly exhausted from all the errands that I run on a single day. Um, but I think it's important to give, give to yourself, give to others. And that just changes the whole, the whole ball game. I mean, um, in the no excuse mob movement, I've made so many incredible friendships. And it's funny that I have this movement and this, this group of women, because growing up, to be honest, I really struggled with my female peers. There was a lot of competitiveness, a lot of cattiness, um, a lot of untrustworthiness amongst each other. And to find a group of women who are so encouraging and supportive and who accept each other, it's, it's really a beautiful place to be. So I'm so thankful that my message went incredibly viral and I was able to create a, a huge movement out of my platform. I mean, it's such a blessing, it really is. Yeah, and, and what I love about that group is that, that there's different women on different spaces on the continuum and there is the trying a shake or you know a powder or something and, and that, that gets them interested but maybe it's not the end result for them, maybe it's not the, the, the end zone. And there's meeting people where they're at and being empathetic to that is what I love so much about that group. There's no right or wrong. Everybody's finding themselves. And yeah. you know, the worst thing to do though is to um, is to to invoke danger on yourself by by doing too much for others and not doing enough for yourself. And I think there's a there's that perfect balance. So that's what I wanted to ask specifically about um, for you. I mean, you, we women today are expected to wear so many different hats. And like I said, there's the ego in the mind, uh, or the, the, sorry, there's the ego in the heart. So questioning, okay, which which one of these would be a better tool for this particular situation right now? But you as a mother, as a businesswoman, as a mentor and a leader, as a wife, and then for yourself, how do you juggle all of that? I just think it's um, interesting that you mention ego and heart very often, you know, because to be honest, I struggle a lot with that. You know, Which I, part? I work in a well with my ego. I think everyone does. I mean, yeah. even in my marriage, I struggle with my ego and his ego. I mean, it's that's why we're very faith driven, you know, we're very Christian. But um, you know, I I have a business. You know, I have a nonprofit and I'm very competitive. And the way that you gauge your success is often through physical elements, you know, which is very ego driven. So it's hard to say, oh, I'm doing so well, but then you have zero dollars in your bank account. You know what I mean? Like, you, right. need, you it's really hard to balance the two, but it is possible to balance the two. And, and I think I'm a representative of that. You know, the nonprofit is something that's been around since 2007. Um, it hasn't really ever given me any um, monetary benefit, but it's definitely impacted thousands of people. And it has made money for other people, but not so much myself. But it's fed my soul. Um, in regards to your question about, what was the question again? Keeping a balance between all of them uh, and know, not robbing yourself. You know, it's, it's really difficult to keep a balance. I mean, I think that... Every single day, I always tell people I create goals. I'm a goal setter. I'm a checklist person, and I make sure that I have my professional, my personal, and my physical goals. You know, and I think that that helps to keep me balanced in my daily life. So there's a lot of people out there, for example, who are really in great shape, but they have really ugly personalities. 
And then there are people who are very rich who are very fat and unhealthy, you know. And then there are people who are very spiritual, but they are broke and they're homeless. And they're, you know what I mean? So you just want to have a balance of um, all these. I mean, I love the number three. It's in my book, The No More Excuses Diet. I think you'll see the number three played out everywhere in this world. I mean, from the the body, mind, and spirit to the professional, personal, physical goals to the, you know, um, even macronutrients, there's protein, carbs, and fats. I mean, the number three is just present everywhere. But um, I definitely try to keep that balance by making sure that I have my three piece set every single morning. Three piece set. What do you mean by that? Um, my professional, my personal, my physical goals, my three P's. How do you wake up every morning? I used to wake up every morning and I used to work out. <laughs> and it just depends. You know, recently I've been going to sleep late and working and then I'd wake up with the kids all in my bed and it's, you know, hitting the snooze button. But the number one thing that I definitely wake up with is I say a small prayer, even if it's, you know, in the bed and I'm not, you know, if I'm around my children in my head, I'm always, you know, saying thank you, God, for another day, you know, and I set my intentions out in my mind. So um, that's how I start my day. I don't drink coffee, you know, I don't. Um, I used to work out in the morning right when I woke up. Sometimes I still do, but not so much anymore because I get so busy. Yeah, the um, the last interview I just did was um, a big part of where I, where I think a lot of women perceive their lack of happiness is because they don't have enough coffee, they don't have enough energy, and so oh, happy, you know, therefore happiness energy. is what. I said that's fake energy. It's fake energy, and I want to talk about that for sure because, um, you know, happiness is bought in the Starbucks drive-through, right? And I'm not saying okay. I'm not knocking Starbucks or anything, but I'm just saying that that you know one of the the most powerful TED talks I've ever heard. I'm not sure if you've heard it, but um, they did these studies to see, uh, you know, income levels and happiness, and they and and also looking at where happiness comes from. And they the the three things that that I took from it was that they said that $75,000 adding any extra income on top of that didn't make people any significantly happier. Um, mm -hmm. So people think that money is gonna make them happier. Then the second one uh, is that 90% of our happiness is, is um, from how we see the world versus our external world and what we have and what we own and who we're with. Um, and then the third thing is, is that the more present that we are, the more happy that we are, even though the present moment may not be favorable. So if I'm in a lot of pain, I'm thinking, oh, just think about me not being in pain and somewhere else the last time I wasn't in pain, that yeah. actually would make me more unhappy. So um, the artificial, artificial, artificial happiness is the rat race I see that you are not on. And I see that you're putting in your mission and, your, um, and everything that you're doing, all of the different hats that you wear. So... Happiness is when I look like this. Happiness is when I take these pills. Happiness is when I kill my body at the gym. What would you say about the majority of women today and moms who are chasing happiness with those three things? You know, I think it's interesting because I think both you and I have been, I think everybody has been in the happiness rat race, right? I mean, I, in my 20s, I competed in bikini contests and I had a really good corporate job. Um, I had, a, I was on the cover of a magazine. I mean, I had a lot of stuff and I realized, you know, while I looked good, was doing good, quote unquote, I didn't feel good. And I felt empty. I felt exploited is a big word. I realized that, I mean, I really got to understand the word exploitation, meaning that, you know, people were around me because I either raised their ticket sales and made them look more handsome. Um, I just made them feel better about who they were. And it's just, I realized that if I did not have my looks, if I didn't have my body, if I didn't have my whatever it was external that they were gluing themselves to me because that I would have lost them. And, and I was losing myself in this process. And because of that, I became bulimic. I mean, I felt empty and I totally believe that everything in your physical environment is a manifestation of how you're feeling inside. So um, I knew that my my what I ended up doing is I quit my corporate job. I moved home to be with my mother who was struggling with kidney failure. I um, started a nonprofit in fitness because I wanted to use my my business skills and apply it to something that was really from my heart. 
and um, and I decided to make certain decisions that were seemingly crazy. Like, for example, marrying my husband was seemed really, you know, out, <laughs> out of the ballpark because he just, you know, there were a lot of challenges in the beginning of our relationship, you know, both him and I. But, you know, it's all about stripping away the ego. He taught me that. And, and I'm learning more about that now. And with mothers, you know, we all want to, you know, have a perfect child and, you know, wondering what's right in terms of should I work or should I not work or should I nurse or what if I can't nurse? I mean, there's all, there's so many mommy wars out there right now. And um, we all, especially with social media, see what seems like perfection, whether it means a perfect marriage or a perfect vacation or perfect children. And people probably see myself in my life and think that I have all those perfect things. And I really hate that because it's the fact is it's not, you know, I struggle often, you know, like I said, um, I used to wake up in the morning, work out. Now I just want to have a, five more minutes of sleep because I'm so exhausted, you know, but women need to hear that. And that's what I love about no excuse moms is that we're very honest and we're very encouraging and we're very um, real in the sense that we're not going to fake it. And um, in terms of energy, you know, it's funny because I do not drink coffee. I don't take those five-hour energy drinks. I don't take any. I used to, though. That's because I, my, my calories were so low, and I was expelling so much energy at the gym trying to be a size zero that I didn't have literally energy. But that's not, that's not real energy. I think that energy is really found within yourself. And within the positive energy that is emanated from the people around you. So, I mean, you, for example, whenever I talk to you, I just feel like, like when we started this conversation, I was just like low on energy. And now I'm like, Ooh. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, that's usually what happens between you and I. And um, I think that when you become more centered in yourself, you start to be more cognizant of the people around you and the energy and the, you know, you, it's, a, it's a good instinct, the vibes that they give you. So, um, yeah, I think you, people need to be very aware of that. There's a lot of fake energy out there. And in terms of what you were talking about with my post about you are what you eat, you are who, blah, 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 blah. I mean, really, I, I really encourage everyone to kind of clean up their social media feeds, their Facebooks, their Instagrams. I mean, there are some people you can scroll through and you just, yeah, they look good or they, they're doing good and they'll tell you they're doing great. And sometimes it's just not good energy. You just need to be very aware that that's just not you just don't want to be like that you don't want yeah. to be like them which is they might look good but they might not be feeling good really inside well i think what you, to your point if we if we show up on social media as the 10 percent of our lives that is happy when you look at the spectrum all these emotions and jp sears i interviewed he was a great he talked about this you know nailed it is that that I believe, and every, everybody that I've been reading about lately on this quest for happiness is that the surefire guarantee to be um, depressed is to chase chronic happiness. You know, there's you know there's a rainbow. It's not all red. It's not all pink. It, it, there's multiple colors of the rainbow, and those are all are the multitude of emotions that we experience. And so, if we show the world this one segment of I'm chronically happy, then it gives other people a false sense that, gosh, I'm never I unattainable. I can never be that happy. Gosh, they look happy all the time. And then it makes them feel even more depressed. And so mm -hmm. when you're following people like that, or if you're surrounding yourself with people who pretend to be chronically happy, it's it's just that that same quest for perpetuating chronic happiness that results in depression, because those aren't, those aren't realistic um, goals for yourself. So when you say clean up your social media and you say, I, I um, urge you to clean up your social media, what do you mean by that? I mean uh, exactly that. The the people who post just unattainable lifestyles, you know, um, they might be great people. There's nothing wrong with that. But I personally have cleaned up. I don't really follow a lot of people anyways. But sometimes when I'm ready, because sometimes there are times when I do feel a little insecure about myself and my life and I'm tired or I'm depressed or I'm feeling a little overweight, whatever it may be. But when there's people who constantly post just happy, they're just always so happy and they have everything and I, it just makes me feel bad. It has nothing to do with them, honestly. It has something to do with me at that moment. And maybe at that moment, I just want to be around people who show a variation 
of their life, a little bit more color to their life. So, um, you know, I definitely don't follow people who, who post a bunch of ass shots or beauty shots or who definitely, who, who constantly promote some type of supplement or they promote something they've never used before, but I know they get paid a thousands of dollars to promote it. I mean, that's not the kind of people I want to follow because that's not the person that I am. I, I, for example, get hit up all the time for people to, to, to promote some detox tea, you know, but I'm not going to do it because I, I don't use it. That's not fair to my followers. So when I notice that there are people out there who are not being fair to their followers and saying they do something that they don't do, or they're happy when they're not happy, or they have this, they really don't. Then I'm like, okay, that's not being very authentic, and I can't follow people who are not authentic or genuine because that's that's not me. So, and I don't, I don't follow the same dream as they do, and that's what I mean by cleaning up your social media feed. Yeah. So, so cleaning up so that you have people who you are inspired by because they show up as who they are, and you feel as um, as the, the a positive disease, you catch that disease and you yeah. feel as though you can show up as who you are without being judged by these. Well, I wouldn't even say that well, people not who, judging. It's how yeah. you feel. You know, right. honestly, people need to be very careful about energy, period. As soon as you wake up, the energy that you, if I'm feeling a certain way, like especially when I'm PMSing, because actually you really can't control that, you know, when you're right before your period, you're definitely feeling a little bit of a hormonal shift in your body. Yep. And I and I and I warn my husband, yeah, my energy is different right now. But it's not just that, it's the energy that he has, it's the energy of my children, it's the food, the energy and the food that I'm eating. It's when I open up my phone and I feel the energy of that person. You know what I mean? Like it's you have to be very aware of what's coming, what we're seeing and what we're feeling and what we're following. So that's why I'm just very careful, very right. careful about my space. Yes. Yes. And that's one thing I love about your brand is that you're authentic to yourself and you, you only share what you're feeling connected to at the moment. And, and I don't know if the word only is very powerful. I know that we all, if we were all only always only, then we would never be pulled back to our authentic self because we would have nothing to, to base it off of. Oh, that didn't feel right. Oh, I was doing something. Who am I doing this for? Am I doing this for attention? Am I doing this to inspire people? Am I doing this, you know, to gain a significant other, or am I doing this to get likes? You know, what am I doing? What's my motivator here? Yeah. And so I, what I, uh, when I saw all of the, the ridicule and the criticism and the way that people responded when you first started your mission, I thought, how awful of these people to judge her. And this is nothing but, th this is just to the reaction to her and she's hitting a nerve and high five sister for hitting the nerve for getting people to really question themselves and their motives because and you're, you're the kind of people that really like the Gandhis of the world that the shift the mindsets of people and get them to really look in the mirror and go, whoa, whoa, there's something here, as long as they're willing to step outside of their ego. So can you speak to the days and the moments, the circumstances, the people that, that came at you and judged you that were really in, in reality them mm -hmm. judging themselves and why you kept going even in that face of judgment, that face of fear of other people continuing to judge you mm -hmm. and project? Yeah, it's, it's interesting that honestly, when every single time someone gave me a story of how they hated me or hated that image or how they reacted, it really was a reflection of themselves, of what they were challenged by. When people were very angry, it just told me they had a very angry past. You know, they have struggled with their weight. They have struggled with bullies. They were upset with the media. They were... Um, they were being ridiculed by their parents. You know, it really showed what their past history was with their struggle, with their weight. And obviously, as a nation, 70% of people are very unhealthy. They're overweight or obese. And so when I asked, what's your excuse? Most people thought they had an excuse. Um, you know, it was very challenging to, honestly, there was like no... TV station or radio station that wasn't trying to get hold of me in those that month of my life when it first went viral. 
And it was very overwhelming. And I thought, how did I get put in this position? How did God place me in this position? Because my voice had really gone very viral. And I could write something and millions of people will read it. I mean, it was pretty incredible to have that power. And then I thought about this and I wrote about this in my blog, MariaKing.com. And I was coming home from New York and I was looking out the window. I had just come off of two talk shows, one being the Today Show, the other one Bethany. And I just started to cry. And I cried like the little girl that I was who used to cry because her mom was sick when I thought she was going to die because she went to the hospital because of a stroke. I mean, I still cry because she's still alive and, and she always has health related issues because of her weight, because of her complacency and her excuses. And I cry for all the other people out there who have mothers who are suffering or who are mothers themselves who cannot find the answers or go overcome their excuses and their challenges to be healthier for their family and for their community. And so even though it was a very difficult time to have a lot of backlash and criticism, the truth is, is that in my 20s, when I was struggling with my ego, when I, did, when I realized this is not happiness, you know, attaining all these awards and, and being on stage and being called beautiful and getting in a magazine, none of that really made me happy. I knew in that moment that being helpful to other people, doing something that's going to make a positive impact and change the world, utilizing the internal gifts that I was given at birth. I mean, there are, I mean, I know it because I have children. Kids have personalities at birth. And at birth, I probably was born with a microphone talking because seriously, this is, <laughs> this is exactly what I was meant to do. This is my bliss, you know, helping others and speaking to people, especially about moving their bodies and getting more active. So I told myself in my 20s when I was going through my spiritual changes, even struggling with bulimia, I told myself that fitness is my mission. Fitness is my bliss. This is my direction. I'm going to start a nonprofit. I'm going to invest my money into this. And this, and even though I had challenges along the way, even though I was 30 pounds overweight, even though I had given birth for three times in three years and my husband and I struggled with our finances, I still made it my mission to stay healthy because I knew the pain of my mother being sick growing up. And my point is, is that, you know, I realized what my bliss was in my 20s. I knew that this was my mission and this is what I was set here to do. And so when I was faced with a lot of um, backlash, I knew, you know what, this is my opportunity because I feel so strongly about this. And whether you agree with me or whether you don't, it's not a matter of if, but when, because this vehicle, this body that you exist in is the only thing that you own in this world. You can buy cars. You can buy, you know, houses, you can buy boobs. I don't know what you want to buy, but there's nothing. You cannot buy good health, period. You cannot buy good health. Boom, drop mic. Boom. <laughs> there's your microphone that you had implanted, surgically know, implanted right? <laughs> when you were born. Um, I took a lot of what you just said. I took a lot of notes there. Um, Oh God, there's, there's one thing that I realized that I didn't before that are aligned with me and you. And this is, this is potentially why we connect so well is that our, our passion project of getting other people outside of their comfort zone to be healthier, to show up for themselves and their families and their friends, um, is rooted in the same thing and that is that when I was young too my mom suffered migraines and my dad was an alcoholic and watching the abuse and you know watching our family crumble and but but seeing it all rooted in health dysfunction and and lack of happiness and codependency uh, my my dad you know wouldn't take medications then he started to take many medications after many strokes and the fear of losing my father has turned into the fear of losing humanity <laughs> to our health because they're not paying attention and so uh, now my biggest fear it sounds like it's similar to yours which is rooted losing my parents and so sometimes it can pro probably we're not always I mean, we're humans we're not always perfect at how we say things you know, we can't please everyone with the delivery of the message because everybody sees things differently and receive thing, receives the message differently depending on their childhood. And I, the, what I heard from what you just said is that everybody connects with what you said, but you're in a different place 
in in that you have resolved some of these emotions and come out the other end with the body dysmorphia and they're still in this pool of victim and suffering and unresolved emotions and it's like almost like you're the mom that's like hey kids do your homework it's your turn you know pull yourself out of this and they're like no because i can't because blah 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 and they almost see you as like this parental figure going no i'm not gonna you can't make me, you're not the boss of me, and and this is how you're making me feel, and it's all your fault. So that's what I see. Is, is well, that you know, I understand where you're coming from. I, I definitely think that, number one, you know, our world is rooted in love, you know, and you're, the first symbol of love is your parents. They love you. You know, they, they're so symbolic of what love is. And the first feeling of losing them possibly to death or sickness or whatever, you know, or any type of loss, that's when you know what pain feels like. Because you can only know pain unless you feel love. And mm -hmm. it, it's very, and it, when, you, when you're motivated in that sense, because of something very deep and um, personal, especially if you're dealing with your parents, it can take you very far. Um, you know, I don't see myself as a parent so much with other people, but I definitely think that, there are certain truths in life, you know what I mean? There's certain, you know how it is because you're a nutritionist. So it's kind of like, okay, you can say whatever you want to say, but this is, this is the facts. You know what I mean? The fact is, is that this is your only body. The fact is you, if you keep going this route, you're going to, you know, change the equilibrium and you're going to go this direction and you're kind of just, you know, they might hate you along the way. They might scream at you and you're just, just, you're just, as a parent, I guess you're just, or as a friend, you're just saying, I'm here, I'm here to support and love you and show you the way. I'm not going to put you down if you don't, if you mess up. But I'm just telling you that this is how it is, and I know you don't like hearing it. But um, I definitely think that in order for anyone to grow, you have to get uncomfortable. And that's another universal lesson right there. In order to grow, you have to be challenged. In order to build a bicep, you have to put strain on that muscle. You know, the muscle fibers will break and in rest it will grow. And that's just how it is. And so in order for you to grow internally, especially psychologically, you know, you need to ask yourself a deep question. And maybe that question is, what is your excuse? You know, what's holding you back? What's the real reason why things are not happening? Stop blaming other people. Start looking at yourself because in order for you to change, you have to change you you don't control anything else outside of you so you have to look within you and ask yourself these deep questions and that's what i love about the conversation that kind of erupted a couple years ago is people started to reflect you know and they started to see a mirror within themselves when i asked what's your excuse what is your dream maria hmm, that's a good one you know what's funny is that i have I've completed a lot of stuff that I wanted to do in my life, you know, from publishing a book to, to creating a nonprofit, all that good stuff. You know, my dream, and I don't want to cry, is my dream would be that my mom would be healthy, you know. Um, and I keep telling people that sometimes you get to a point where it becomes very difficult to be healthy, you know, when you have, when you're really relying on a lot of pills and you can't walk anymore. And you really created an environment full of negative energy. And you have enablers that are just negative. Um, you know, my dream is just to have a happy marriage, to have to raise kids that are going to be great soldiers. You know, not mm -hmm. soldiers like for the, for the U.S. Army, but like life soldiers. I mean, I wrote a poem called Soldier of Life in 2005. And... That's like my life message, mission to be a soldier of life. You know, we never know the time or the day that we're going to die. But I hope that while I'm here, while my spirit is manifested in this body, that I'm going to make a positive impact and that everything I do and the people that I interact with will feel the loving energy that was gifted inside of myself, you know. So that's my dream, to impact as much, many people as I can. And and to do it to the moment I die. And how do you know when that day comes that, look, I'm living my dream? Like, what is that? What, what is, is like? 
Yeah, what is, when you say I'm, my dream I, is to impact as many people as possible, like at what point do you just sit, sit back and go, ah, it's no longer a goal, I'm living it, and I can revise it, but wow, look, I'm here, without you know being complacent. Well, here's what I think. I think that everybody right now is living their dream because it begins with the realization that you have a choice right now to change your attitude, to accept your life, to be living present in this moment and know that everything that is right now is because of all you've done in your past and you can pretty much create your future based on your actions right now. I mean, free will in the Bible. I mean, that's the, that's the greatest gift that you have and you have it right now. You can choose right now what matters to you. You can choose right now that that doesn't matter to you. You know what I mean? So it's pretty incredible to look at your life and say, you know, I'm going to choose to be happy right now. This is it right now. You know, so how do you know? I mean, right now, I think I, I have an amazing life. And yesterday I felt the same way. <laughs> Tomorrow I'm going to feel the same way. And, you know, sometimes I don't feel that way. But then when I don't feel that way, that's when I have to change my attitude and really pray. And this is where the, the, how important gratitude is, you know? So whenever I feel like crap, like really crappy, I think, well, what am I thankful for? And I, sometimes I have a diary. I've had a diary since I was in fifth grade and I'd write down everything I'm thankful for. I mean, I have, first off, I have a brain, you know what I mean? I have two arms and two legs. I mean, and you think of all the people who don't have that. And then you think about, and then you, you're like, okay, well, I live in a, not in a war torn country. You know I mean? Mm -hmm. There's so many things that you have once you start to have gratitude for the things that exist in your life right now. So, I mean, it's interesting when I get emails from people and they say, Oh, I'm so unhappy. And I, and I size whatever. And I'm like, you know what, if you're not happy now at size, whatever, you're not going to be happy at this size right here. You know, you need to be happy now. Good point. You know? Yeah. Good point. Plus the formula for happiness is ever evolving in fashion. It's, you know, it's like when we were, when you were doing bikini stuff and when I was doing my figure competitive competing, it was like the formula was always changing. And the, the, the day before I hopped on stage for state, um, state NPC, my trainer said, Oh, you, this is the best you've ever looked. You look great. You're going to kill it tomorrow. And I got up on stage and I looked at the other woman and I went, are these, Whoa, Wait, I look good compared to that. So then I got 11th place and the top five were massive women. Uh -huh. And then, and, and my trainers were like, oh, it's, it's because, you know, the formula changed and, and you do look good, but it was from the old, old formula. And I'm like, I'm constantly trying to look good for a formula that is always changing and it's unattainable. And why can't I just be happy with where I am at right now? I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> oh, good for you. I, I remember anymore. being on stage and I was top five. And oh, I think he'd over, with over 70 girls. And this girl won. She's like, I said, you look so good. And we're there holding roses. And she said, you look so good too. And I said, no, I don't, not compared to you. And I'm thinking in my head, what a crazy girl I was because I looked really good. But obviously, I didn't feel very good. And that's what's so sad is that people, it's just like, I feel like our world is just, very insecure yes we're, and we're chasing security security you know what i mean yes so it's interesting i feel like i don't want to say it but i think that a lot of people in the bikini contest are very insecure you know and i think that a lot of people who are in just hope for high profile anything are very insecure people you know why do you need all that stuff why do yes. you need to go to that extreme why, what is that title going to tell you about yourself, you know? So. Yeah, it's, it's, it's so crazy. When I, I just decided to do a fun show last year, just for fun, because it was my friend who was putting on the shows. And, and I went up on stage and I, I didn't do anything crazy. I just, you know, maybe worked out a little bit more. I, I really mm -hmm. didn't change my diet at all. And I went from 17% to 12% body fat in like six weeks. Um, because you know, when your body is resilient, it can react pretty well. And I went up on stage and I was like, I'm just going to have fun. This is just for fun. And I'm secure in myself. And I got third place and I was like, Oh great. I got third place out of like 12 girls. 
and I posted my pictures and it was like more people commented and followed on that sort of thing and confirmed my ego, you know, what I, you know, what, what I was, what was I doing this for? It wasn't ego this time as much as it was just heart and for fun. And I was like, God, this is so nuts. I can post all day long about the beauty of vulnerability yeah. and, and cry and just show people, you know, what's going on in my life and what's affecting me right now. And that won't get as much activity as this, this fake stuff. Like I got a trophy look and it's like, I did that kind of as a, just a project as a, you game? should take a you should take a picture of you bending down backwards and see how many posts you can get. <laughs> oh God, another experiment, right? <laughs> oh. No, but you know what? I mean, even myself, because we're not perfect. I am not perfect, and you know, I struggle with that balance of ego and heart all the time. I mean, I have a large social media following too, and in the past, I think that I'm more. I don't want to say the word shame or ashamed, but I wish I didn't post some selfies of myself, at least of my midsection, because I mean, what's the point? I mean, I was proud. I think that's the biggest thing. But I mean, at the same time, did I make other people feel, I mean, you really can't control how other people are going to react. Yes. yes. But um, I do know that I have done a pretty good job of being authentic on my social media, because I do know that if you post more, you know, beauty selfies or sexual you know, um, provocative selfies that you're going to get more followers. And I didn't want to go that route because I didn't want the following to want more of that from me. You know, in fact, I noticed that if I do post selfies, I lose followers. So my, my people know me, they are like, I don't want to see that. <laughs> don't worry. That's, we didn't want to see your backside, even though I've never really posted my backside, but you know what I'm talking about. I think it's yeah. um, interesting that, it, it, I think social media is a very good example of how how it is to live a life where you know this does this, but then you want to hold back because it really isn't the result that you want, you know? Mm -hmm. So I know people who have millions of followers because they have a really large derriere, but they struggle with people taking them seriously or people seeing their authentic self because they're so focused on their external, you know, look. and but that's what they built and it's, it's unfortunate, you know, and then you become addicted to that. You become addicted to the attention. You get addicted yeah. to the money that brings the attention. You know what I mean? It's just, it's a, it's a hard cycle to break. That, that got me, that got a good question. It's like when you're taking an inventory of your time, what are you building? What, what are you investing your time into building more your, mm -hmm. your external or your internal? Um, you know, how much time do you spend at the gym? How much time do you spend refreshing your Facebook feed? How much time do you spend trying to impress people that for the wrong reasons? You know, how much, if you really took an inventory of your time mm -hmm. and you wrote it down, like who, who do I follow the most? Who do I hang out with the most? And this is going back to your post about you are what you eat, who you hang out with, the average sum of the top five people you spend the most time with. Um, you are what you read, you know, you, you yeah. all of those things. It's like, what, it, it, it taking an inventory of all of that would be perhaps a good habit that's born out of this interview where the birthplace of happiness is inauthenticity and awareness and knowing being aware of where you're putting you know where you're putting all of your time and putting all of your money we did a financial um, interview with Danny J so you guys can watch that one for for finance and she's she's like you. She talks about tithing, doing a lot of volunteer work, tithing ten percent of what you make, and 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 giving it to others, and um, being able to receive love as much as you're giving love too. So one of the things you said earlier was and I wanted to ask you: Did you feel like when your mom's health declined, you felt less in control of your life because you were less in control of the outcome of her health? I, well, I think that um, knowing that you don't have control over what's going to be, well, let me, let me rephrase this. You know, there have been times when I remember driving to the hospital crying, praying my rosary because my mom just got out of surgery and they had to do another surgery because she had a heart attack in recovery. I mean, stuff like that makes you realize that you have no control. You know, it's out of the control. 
and you just have to let go and let God. I mean, it really helped me build my faith. Um, you know, having an unhealthy parent is so tough. And I, you know, I used to make my mom breakfast every single morning and, and make her lunch and clean the house. In fact, I think I became a perfectionist because I wanted to make her life so easy that she could start taking care of herself. And it never ended up that way. And, and that's, and I, and, and what's funny is that even right now I have a pretty clean house for it being pretty big and not having a, not having a house cleaner, but I've always, you know, I started to exist in a, I started to cope in a way where I tried to make my world look and appear perfect, even though it wasn't, you know, it's interesting how people cope with um, distress in their life or adversity. And it can go two ways. I mean, my perfectionism has helped me get two degrees. You know, it helped me attain many awards. It helps me today because I'm still a little bit of a perfectionist. However, when I was bulimic, it, go, it can go definitely a different way, you know, where it's like out of control OCD. Um, but, you know, dealing with an unhealthy parent really made me realize that, you know, life is not fair, number one that you have no control, number two, and that you really need to just do the best that you can, knowing that, you know, here's your mother who is who is who a part of you but separate from you. So it's very interesting the um just the dynamics between a mother and a daughter. Yeah, I know the same thing. I just had a great talk with my mom yesterday and that God, I was thinking if I if I had a daughter right now and she was 13 mm -hmm. and I'm 37 years old, whole what would my life look like if I was raising myself? <laughs> I was a nightmare when I was 13 up until the age I was 30 probably. <laughs> so I and I used to blame my mom for my source of unhappiness and my depression. Yeah. And like how oh, and I, I feel like I owe my mom a lifetime of, of apologies for putting her through that. But then again, I told her, Mom, we come here with different agreements, and you know, you chose me just like I chose you. So, you know, you learned something from me just like I learned from you. And now, of course, lo and behold, my brother, who blames me for his depression in childhood, now has a daughter that is me. <laughs> and I'm That's like, so Mom, cute. yeah, I'm like, Mom, see, I told you, you know, like there, there's always a reason yeah. for everything, and, and maybe him having to deal with me and the craziness as I was as a teenager, helped prepare him for his fatherhood with this, with his daughter. So if you really surrender to that control and, and trust, and, and trust that God, like you said, let go and let God, and, and realize that this is all happening for a reason, and just to let go and surrender to things that we can't control, focus on ourselves, focus on our family, the things we can't control, let it go if you can't, and, and take an inventory of where do I feel out of control in my life right now? So for you, it was bulimia. Where do well, you well, I also have to say that I think it's very important that people identify kind of where they were as a child, you know, and their relationship with their parent. I know in my 20s when I was struggling, um, I wrote a, like a eight page letter to my mom crying at 2 a.m. Just writing, just realizing what an impact she had made in my life. And I realized that a lot of the things that I did was because of her. You know, she she's my biggest supporter, but at the same time, I felt that I owed it to her. I owed it to her to do well because she had kids early in life and she couldn't do things because of us. I owed it to her to become a beauty queen, to become a cheerleader, to, to go live in a city by herself because my mother couldn't be any of those things or wasn't able to do that or accomplish it because of various reasons. And um, it's just interesting, just like I said, that relationship between not just mother and daughter, a mother and son or son and father. I mean, I think those relationships really tie into who you become and who you are today. And if you can kind of untie yourself and realize that you're separate from that, you're not your mother, you're not your father, and and, and just cut those umbilical cords, because that's what I did in my 20s, finally. You know, but it took a really long time to really identify that everything that I was doing was not because I wanted to do it. I did it because they wanted me to do it. 
or you know they they promoted that and and I wanted to do it to make them proud but what did I want and I think that um, I think that's that was a huge eye-opener and a spiritual just a weakness for me is realizing that relationship um, that I have with my mom spiritually <laughs> and just, we still have that relationship but it's not so much not so much why well, meaning not so much where she's so like she can instantly like well in the sense that in the past I used to do things because I wanted to make her proud now I just do stuff because I just want to do it and I don't care if I make her proud or not you know yes you've yeah. detached yourself you've detached yourself yes. from the outcome of an action and that's the definition of unconditional love which is what Jesus talks about in the Bible and every yeah. other religion is is the whole theory of unconditional love and doing things oh there was a cool oh there was another one Maria there's I, I, I want this to be linked somewhere so people can see it but there's a there is a study done re recently recently I don't know what it was but I was listening to a TED talk and they said that um, oh this is what it was um, talking about the body and the body's chemistry and the reaction when we're digesting our food and the good bugs that that when we're consuming food and we have a positive mindset and we're thinking um, we're not thinking about other things that are distracting and we're just being present that we actually have um, better ability to digest our food and we have healthier enzymes, bacteria, things to, to do their job and we can actually inspire immunity in self just by the thoughts that when we're, when we're consuming our food. So that's the, the literal biochemical feedback that goes on with mind, body uh, consumption. And I, I thought that was that. really neat. I thought it was really, really powerful. Um, it was a study, I'll, I'll link that study so I'm gonna make a note here for myself. But so what, maybe what, people should like pray before they eat. Yes. Yes. I mean, because that's what we do. It's like thank, be thankful for the food you're eating. It's nourishing your body. You know. Yeah, yeah. That was um, the 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 love goes into the food, and I think we've lost that connection. I think a lot of people have lost that connection. We're eating on the go. We're not sitting down with our families. We're not saying a prayer. We've got broken We're homes. We're connected to the food. Yes. We're disconnected from ourselves and from our higher power, yeah. whoever that is. So, and, and you said something powerful there. Um, before we wrap up, you said, and I, I was blogging this morning about a very embarrassing virus I contracted when I was younger, and I'm, I'm gonna share it on you know my social media and my website and stuff because I know a lot of women struggle with it. But you, you are not your parents. You are not your virus. You are not your disease. You are not your symptoms. And so what I've heard you say to summarize that is that we need to discover our identity, who we really are, what we're here for. And if your dream is bigger than your nightmare, then like you, Maria, it, it won't matter what the outside world thinks of you because that's not what you're here to do is to entertain other people's judgment. You're here to spread a mission with that, that's backed by and fueled with positive intention and how people take it you know I know I've also read that there's like four different ways that we learn and we're motivated by stuff if you say it in one way of the four then you, if you reach 25% of people then you're gonna offend 75% and yeah. you know if you see life that way like hey I, you can't please everyone realize that it's part of being a human then you have things aligned so that your expectations are that yeah I'm gonna piss a lot of people off with my message but um, my message is um, my message my gift of being here is is larger than myself and mm -hmm. that's what I'm here for so if you could summarize and cliff note three things that people can start doing today that are habits to happiness that you embody and that um, you've seen success with that you would like to share how would you sum that up like on a daily day-to-day -day basis they could be doing you know what? I, I have a, a little guest here. Oh, he can share it. <laughs> and he was he's talking back, when you were talking. Back. He was talking when you were talking. So three things that I could share with people that they can say that again. Three things that that people can do on a day to day basis. Three things today that are easier to implement, big impact that can pave their way to a happier, more balanced life where they're not chasing happy chronic happiness in other words 
I think number one, I mean, to to set the three P's every morning: your professional, your personal, and your physical goals. Oh, have that, kids. have that balance. Yeah, right? I have. Yeah, do you? What is it? You're my kid. So that's I'm number one. Kid. No, shut up. I have kids. Oh, yeah. And he wants a play date. He's like, do you have kids? I'm going to go to a play date. Aww. <laughs> uh, and then number two, I would say, you know, make sure that you have, I would, I am a big person when it comes to reflections. I love to have a diary. I love to speak to myself and how I'm feeling. But when I'm depressed or when I'm happy, I like to write it down and just release those emotions and really show gratitude you know what am i thankful for write down that list you know yeah, and the last yeah. thing that people can do i i stop it honey of course i'm going to say you got to work out <laughs> <laughs> and only because you know what movement is circulation circulation is is really life you know so you will feel a thousand times better when you when you circulate your body, when you move, take action. So those are the three big things that I would um, recommend to people. So you said personal, professional, and physical? Mm -hmm. Yep. And what was the summary of the professional one? The summary for the professional goals? Yeah, this, the, the quick, like if you memeable, like the one tip that you'd recommend them for professional, because Gabriel came and sat down, so it didn't quite finish. Oh, I mean, like professional goals are, is anything, whether it's um, in your work life, whether it's in the stop it, honey, whether it's in your, like, even if it's not work, like to me, my nonprofit isn't work so much, but it's something that um, is not so much, I have to drop everything. Um, so there's professional, and then there's personal, which is your, maybe your spiritual, maybe it's your personal relationships with your, um, your friends or your family members. And then your physical goals, you know, make sure you make a goal to get active. Make it your yeah. goal to, yeah. Yeah, and you could even combine those sometimes too when people say, oh, I don't have time to be physical. It's like all of my girlfriend outings, I'm, I, I, I'm like, oh, let's do yoga. Let's go run outside. Let's, you know, go for a hike. So you can, if you don't have time to do that, then merge merge those things. And, oh, totally. Yeah. That's an ideal. Yeah, and be perfect. out there all the time. Me and you, if we went near each other, we'd be, we'd be hiking every day. I know. I, I always hiking. think about that. I always think about that. I'm like, I wish we could just do this not over a phone, over Google Plus. <laughs> we'd like in person. There's something about, you know, there's oxytocin, the hormones that you guys oh, yeah. are exchanging right now. That that love hormone is something that we're lacking too. So. Um, you know, the physical part of that is a physical touch, which is a great way to end on this. Make sure that you've got lots of hugs and lots kisses in your life. Time. Yeah. Yes. Like right now you're infusing him with probiotics with that physical touch and lots of <laughs> oxytocin love hormones. So um, moms, if you feel deficient in happiness, you can always just hug your kid. I mean, they're abundantly full of pure uh -huh. joy, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so you're getting your dose right now. <laughs> okay, Maria, what are your final closing thoughts before we take off? And I, I um, refer them to the link below. Uh, final closing thoughts. Well, thank you for having me, Diane. You know, really, you truly are. Um, so, the ep I used to say epitome. Can you believe that? <laughs> You're the epitome of, you know, what a warrior is. You know, I've seen you, like I said, I evolve, you know, in the last several years. And you have so much courage to say, um, to say and think what's genuinely in your head that's very true to your heart and I really just appreciate that and um, and I think that our friendship is really an example of energies connecting with like energies so I want to thank you for having me on this um, I want to tell your followers you know whether or not I mean you may know me from the controversial photo, but definitely follow up. You know, I've done a lot since then. I have a no too small platform. We have hundreds of free mom groups in 25 countries. I mean, it's pretty incredible. And all of these women are beautiful, strong. They, they, they <laughs> represent various sizes, shapes, and ages. And I really encourage you to go to our website and find the closest group to you and get involved. He said, can you marry me? <laughs> Did he really just say that? Yes. <laughs>
<laughs> okay, Maria, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for showing up as authentic as you are, as always, and for inspiring moms around the world. And of course, dads too, because I know you have a dad's group as well. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye. Use your heart to happiness, never forget. <laughs>